Hey, everybody, it's Daniel Dixon. We're bringing back one of our most impactful episodes with the real estate powerhouse himself, Mr. Brett Tanner. In this episode, Brett shares the strategies that have helped propel him to the top and how he's helping others build wealth through the KW Wealth community. Whether you're turning in for the first time or giving this a second listen, you won't want to miss this. Let's dive in and enjoy. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Color Money Podcast. Now, today is a very special day for us. We have the one, the only, Mr. Brett Tanner joining us today. I'm super excited about this episode because Brett not only is a coach, friend, mentor, everything to me in my life, but this man and what he understands about wealth building, about real estate, about teams, about all the things that have to do in this ecosystem of real estate this, I mean, we could probably do this podcast for, for four hours, five hours with all the information he has. Now, since 2009, Brett has sold over 5,500 homes and is ranked high as number nine producing agent in the entire country. Brett owns multiple ancillary businesses that are all tied in and directly correlated to real estate. Every year, Brett flips 50 plus houses, and he currently owns over 200 long-term rentals and notes around the country. Brett's real estate network, the Be Wealthy Network, has over 35 locations with over 300 active members, and he currently operates in over 20 states. Today's Brett's experience is sought after as a national speaker and mentor focusing primarily on wealth development. He currently serves as a community leader of KW Wealth and is passionate about helping other real estate professionals develop an internal wealth plan and execute those strategies to achieve massive wealth. Brett, thank you so much for doing this with us today. I can't wait to get all the information, all the knowledge, all the nuggets, um, all the nuggets from you, man. Welcome. My pleasure, man. I'm excited to be here. Anytime I get to hang out with you, I love Emmerich. Anytime I get to hang out with you guys, I'm in. Uh, I'm always here. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's a few things I want to get with our listeners today. I want to I want to have a conversation that's strictly about wealth. We'll talk about KW Wealth. We'll talk about the eight weeks. We'll talk about the 30 year plan and some of those additional things. But tell me a little bit about this journey for you. Why did this pivot and change? I know you've always been about wealth, but now it's we're being more vocal and we're trying to teach more agents about this wealth building journey. Where did that come from? What's that about? So if you went back, right, so I got my license in 2005. And prior to that, I got my license to actually do my own investments, right? So I was flipping homes, you know, doing one here or there, the capital I had at that time. And I got my license just to facilitate those transactions. So I always, I started as an investor, right? I fell into the agent business and fell in love with, with that side of the retail business. So I've always had a focus. But then if you, if you fast forward a bit, you know, when the world got kind of weird, uh, in 2008, I almost left the business. I was like, this is hard. Kind of felt uh, the world in 2007, eight feels a little kind of like today just got harder. Like things changed, kind of felt like who moved my cheese, right? The world's a little different place. And then by 2011, from almost leaving, you know, we were number nine in the country. And it was at that point where I realized that selling homes alone wasn't going to make me wealthy because I was, I was doing well by every measurable stat. I was really successful. And I'm looking around at people that had had that level of success for a long period of time, but they weren't wealthy. So I'm like, well, wait a minute. Like, Daniel, I'm thinking, how can you go be in this business for 20 or 30 years selling the most valuable thing in the world, which is like all the, the richest people in the world, the number one asset outside of their private companies is real estate, right? As an agent, you have access to the number one asset, yet agents that have been at the peak of their game for decades and decades weren't wealthy. And so I kind of looked at it and said, the skills that make me a great real estate agent and allow me to build a really big company are not the same skills that will make me wealthy. And so I've spent the last, whatever it's been, almost 15 years studying how do the really wealthy think about money, right? How are they thinking about it? What's their strategy? What's the mindset? And really, it's you really dig into it. The mindset's where it all starts. And so for me, it just, it started from a moment realizing what I was doing was not going to get me where I wanted to go. And I had to find it. I had to ask different questions to get different answers. Yeah. And I think every, it's like every, every guest that we have really comes back to some sort of mindset. And it's a mindset that unlocks the actual potential of actually building that wealth. Like what, what changed in your mindset? What, what, what were you starting to think or what, like what process changed for you? 
So you start looking at that. I thought to have a lot of money to be wealthy, you had to make a lot of money, right? So then I started looking and you just start digging in and start looking at people that have real money, not fake online Instagram, you know, money, but durable wealth. And there, there was a correlation of income, right? Higher income wealth, but it wasn't directly correlated. I know some people that didn't make, you know, a million dollars a year yet were really, really wealthy. And so it became part of those a conversation. So the, the fundamental one, it starts with just how am I actually measuring progress? And so, you know, I start with, you know, for me, I didn't have all the, you know, these incredible tools. I was tracking my net worth kind of sometimes right back 2005, six, seven. And it was Gary, Gary, like in front of the room one day, he's like, Hey, Brett, do you have to track your net worth? I'm like, yeah, all the times I want to, right. If it's going up. You bet. I know the number. Uh, <laughs> and he goes, Oh, do you track it every month, every week. Do you know exactly every number? I was like, no, he goes, cool. You'll never be wealthy. And he kind of blasted me in front of people. And I was like, dude, what a, it's aggressive. Um, but he was right, right. If I'm not tracking it, how will I know if I've got to have progress? So then I was like, all right, well, I'm here today, right? I've got this number. We'll call it a million bucks or the number is. And then I'm like, well, how will I know if I'm on track for 30 years from now? So I don't end up at the end of my career with a big house and a late model BMW. How do I have more than that? Right. And then just a top realtor. And so I came up with this idea. What if I just picked a huge number 30 years from now and then figured out where do I need to be every single year so that I hit that number? And that was the unlock for me. Once I had a way to measure progress every year and every month, because then it's a game I can win, right? As soon as I know, like I know where I'm at right now, like December, December 1st, I did my balance sheet, right? And I look at, well, where do I got to be in January of 2024? That's not that hard to figure out. But what about January 2025? How do I feel about that? How about 2026? So right now on my balance sheet, I'm living in the year like 2030. In other words, I'm ahead of the game yeah. of where I want, but because of the measurement tool. So I would say if, you, if I only gave one thing, it would be you've got to find a way to know that you're going to hit your destination that's decades in the future on the actions, the decisions, the relationships that you're building today. You do that, everything else is possible. Well, you know, Brett, that, that's interesting. Like you're giving this this view of wealth, right? And I believe that a lot of us, a lot of folks, don't really understand wealth. They understand being rich, <laughs> because so many people come from a perspective where they they never had enough money, so they believe that accumulating enough money is what you require. And when you understand it, accumulating money just makes you rich. It doesn't make you wealthy to a certain degree. It makes you rich. And so you're having a wealthy conversation. I, I think I believe part of this conversation has to be how do we get from thinking about being rich to thinking about being wealthy? Because you're talking about your balance sheet and rich people may not have a balance sheet. They may have a balance on their account, on their checking account, their savings account and maybe a money market account, they don't have a real balance sheet. I, I believe that's where a lot of people get confused with being rich and being wealthy. So how do you get from being rich? What's, how do you make that transition from being rich to being wealthy? To me, it's all passive income, right? The, the thing that creates wealth is where you don't have to work, right? So if you've got $30 million in Tesla stock today, you can't quit working. Unless you want to start selling your stock to pay for your bills, right? If I've got Tesla stock, it doesn't currently pay a dividend. And it, look, I'm despite current things, right? In terms of someone putting us on Mars, I'm an Elon fan for getting us to Mars, right? Like I'm anybody that says, "Hey, I'm worried about human beings as a race, as a species." I'm all in. Um, however, that stock doesn't pay a dividend, so I'm not going to get cash flow from that. So to me, well, the first measurement stick is number one. I got to know what I spend every month. Like what is on? I call it burn rate. Right. So naturally, Emmerich, naturally, Daniel, and myself, there's an amount of money that I'm very comfortable spending. And it's by the way, it's what you're spending right now. Like, I know that Daniel's very comfortable. I know Emmerich, I'm comfortable spending whatever I'm spending. So when I talk about just starting to understand your money, I don't want you to go, you know, buy a bag of beans, and a bag of rice and live cheap because I think that sucks. Right. No one wants to work their ass off and and live cheap. I just think that's a, a crappy way to do it. However, We've got to pick a number, right? Okay, let's call that, I'm going to make a, let's call it $15,000 a month. Now you're saying, well, what, 
what do I have to do with my money so that I could get $15,000 a month that comes into me that I don't have to work for? Like, what do I have to do? Right. So that's where I'd start. You get to that number to where whether I work or not, everything's paid for. Look, you are going to be just fine. You're in a great place. Now, that's not wealth, but that is going to get you what they call, you know, financially free. I'm just going to say it takes the pressure off. Right. Now you now you can go get to do the things you really want to do. Second level of that, you get to three times your burn rate. So if it's 15,000, if you have $45,000 a month coming in, whether you work or not, in this example, you're, you're, you're on your way to being wealthy. I don't think you're ridiculously wealthy, but I'm going to tell you what, you are going to be the most comfortable person out there because now you can do all the things, right? You can do whatever you want. You can even increase your burn rate and you still got money coming in. You get to 10 times that number, it's game over. You are on your way to becoming one of the wealthiest people you've ever met, right? If your burn rate is $15,000 a month and you got 150,000 a month coming in, whether you work or not, the game is over. You won. It's just, it's a wrap. And so, so I think Emmerich to answer your question, it's like people are rich because they're like, oh, I got a lot of money in my checking account, or I just paid cash for this new car, or I can do this. Yeah. You can only do that as long as you're doing the thing you're doing that made money. Once you quit doing the thing that makes the money, now we get to find out how wealthy you are. And so that's that's how I come to, to think about wealth is if all of us couldn't go work, who can last the longest without doing anything to work? Okay. Another measure. I like that. I like that. I like that a lot. If all of us quit working tomorrow, who's going to last the longest? Now you're playing the wealthy game. It's one of the biggest mistakes that I've made over the last few years is we made a lot of money and my balance sheet was looking beautiful, but the focus for me was not on cash flow. And so now the world goes crazy. The world goes weird. And then now all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, we're not printing the money that we were in our real estate and our our mortgage businesses. And it changes the game and and the focus of that cash flow conversation, um, that passive income conversation, and not just having a pretty net worth or owning a bunch of real estate that's growing in value if it's not producing that cash flow back to you. Huge learning lesson. 100%. Every decision, every investment you make literally should be a cash flow investment. I have nothing, not one thing in my portfolio that's speculative, that's dirt, that's some stock. I have zero dollars in the stock market. Not, I mean, none, zero. I don't play that because I, I, I like to play rigged games, right? And I believe that real estate as a real estate agent is a rigged game. I don't mean rigged in a bad way. I'm not, I'm just saying I, I know the value of a house, what I can buy. I know what I can sell it for. I know what I can buy it for. I know what it costs to fix it. In that context, largely I'm playing a rig. I know what I can do there, right? So if you're going to play the stock market, you need to know why is that stock going to go up? Not some tip from your neighbor, but why are they going to outperform what the analysts believed, right? You always think all markets are forward looking and there's really smart people that are way smarter than all of us trying to figure all that out. What I know is that every person watching this is an expert at selling real estate in their town, in their street, near their home, right? They know that area. So you know what a good deal is and a bad deal is. If you know that, you can compete. You have an unfair advantage. And I am beyond passionate that real estate agents should be the wealthiest industry, period, of any other industry. They should be. Like there's not even – it shouldn't be a – Everyone should walk down the street. What do you do for a living? So I'm in real estate. They're like, oh my gosh, Daniel Emmerich, you must be ridiculously wealthy because you're in real estate. That should be the case. And the right. challenge is just agents have not learned the skills to translate. They have the knowledge. They have all the things. Now we just got to get them to apply it to their own life and, and not only to their clients. I want you to help your clients become wealthy. I love that. I just want every agent to put their mask on first and have them become wealthy first. Yeah. And I think one of the things that you teach through KW Wealth, and I want to, I want to go through really quick is the, 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 I want to call it the, I can't remember what you call it exactly, but like the listing hierarchy, meaning the last thing we want to do is actually put a sign in the front yard. And when I explain that to people in my market center or people in, in my, my ecosystem, they're like, wait, that's the last thing that you want to do? And I'm like, yes, we, this is, this is the mindset of being a wealthy realtor it changes when you think about acquiring or controlling that property prior to putting your sign in the front yard. So can you walk us through that, that hierarchy piece? Yeah. So when I, you know, you, the old saying, right, you get into real estate, they say, you got to take a lot of listings. That's how you last. And um, 
I, I think the saying is right, list to last. I just think you should list the house last. And so when I look at a deal, right, first, you know, again, I, I was an investor, got my real estate license. I go on my first appointment. I'm like, let's pretend it was Emmerich. I go to Emmerich. I'm like, dude, you want to list your house? Cool. Come. I'd love to buy it. I don't, I'm a licensed realtor. I know that's why I'm here. I'd love to just buy your home. Now, did it work? No. Emmerich's like, no, I want to list. He wanted more money than what that I was willing to pay. But in other words, if you walk into every living, living room with your investor hat on and say, look, I want to buy this house. I want to buy it for my portfolio. Right? Why? That's going to get me to wealth faster, right? It's going to create passive income. But let's just say I go out there and, you know, so first thing I do, I want to buy it. Second thing, maybe I don't want to buy it. It doesn't fit my portfolio, but I know Daniel would buy this. But if I put it under contract, I can control that contract. Well, now I could work with Daniel, right? I could sell you that contract. I could double close. There's ways I could work there. You know, for me, I love buying property. I love becoming the bank, right? More complicated strategy, but I want to buy homes, find a great quality borrower, help them get into home ownership, and I'm going to carry the paper just like a bank would. 30 year fixed, you know, our rates are around whatever 9.9%, which seemed crazy when rates were that low. Today, I'm, I'm relatively low cost, you know, relatively speaking. So from there, right, then I go, all right, if those three things can't work, and that's my highest value, then I go, all right, what if I flip it, right? I don't want the deal in my portfolio. Can I add value and flip that home? And if I can't do that, then I go to my database. Do I already have another buyer that wants this house? Can I possibly double in this thing? And then if none of that works, I'll list the home. Sure. I'd love to list it. Let's do that. And we'll help you. We, you know, help you get more money in less time. The point is I run through that every single time. Because I want to buy more real estate. I hold a real estate license and I'm in the real estate sales business for only one reason, to buy real estate. Like that is the reason why I'm in yeah. business. And I think if you take a step back, look, yes, I have great customer service. I love my clients. And, and all the times, we 98% of the time, that's the thing we're doing, right? We're helping buyers and sellers. But those 2% of the times where you can buy it, it does make sense. And I just have a fundamental belief that the MLS doesn't solve everyone's problems. It doesn't. There are times where that seller needs to close in seven days. They need to stay there for 90 days because they need their proceeds to make things right, to go move on. There's a lot of reasons why people sell a home and getting the most price doesn't, doesn't solve all their problems. And so I think as agents, we're problem solvers and you can help people and make money. And, and that's where I think the ultimate transition can occur. Now, when you think about KW Wealth and you wanting to be, um, I mean, these these are principles that you started teaching me eight years ago when we started coaching. So these are, I lucked out early enough by being in your in your orbit that, that we could start thinking this way. But when you started the journey of building out KW Wealth and really trying to help agents, I think it's it's such a it's such a unique value add because it's not a conversation that a lot of people are having. There's a million there's a million things about downlines and how to be a better listing agent and buy a representation and all these things, but no one's talking about wealth in the sense of, to your point, real estate agents should be the wealthiest industry on the planet. So when you launched KW Wealth, what was the what was the intention? Is, is there a goal with the amount of realtors that you want to impact? Is it a KW thing where you want all these KW agents to grow or what, was, what, what is what is KW Wealth exactly, and, and what was the passion behind that? So it was family reunion, not 2023, 2022. Uh, so I went around, and a large part of my wealth-building journey has been impacted by Gary Keller, right? I've had the good fortune of, of being in his room for 15 years, and today I would say we're very, very close friends. He's my coach, full disclosure, so I'm coached by Gary, and um, he's transformed the way I think about it. So a lot of my conversations came from him. Right, whether that was a private conversation in his room, at Mega Cam, at Family Reunion, you know, in a, when I say in his room, in his mastermind, uh, so so that's always been there, right? He's always talked about money, and I left that Family Reunion and I said, hey, I think we could do more. In other words, we're never going to have the way that Keller was set up, right? We're never going to have an event where it's all about wealth building the whole thing. And I just said, I think we need a division. I don't know the name or the words for this, but I want a division or something over here that is all about wealth building. And in classic Gary fashion, he says, put together a one pager and send it to me. So I did. I said, this is what I think it looks like. This is how I'd like to deliver the material. Here's what I think the curriculum is. And at the end of that, he comes back with, uh, not only do I love it, I want to be involved, right? I want to be involved in the curriculum. I want to come and help teach. And so 
That's where it started. So it started with, let's have a community that's very, very low cost. Let's have a way for people to just have a different conversation. And so it started there. And then we've got a high-end mastermind in KW Wealth that's for folks that are, you know, further along that want to go faster and want to have just these deeper, high, high level conversations. And, and just to give you a short answer, I really just wanted to create the room that I wanted to be in, right? Selfishly, this is the conversation that I want to have. And I've had it with you privately, right? And I've had it in small groups, but let's go have that conversation with as many people that, that want to engage in that. Let's have it. So that was the idea. Now, why are you seeing, why didn't more people do it? I'll give you a hard hitting answer, right? It's the hardest thing to fake. You yeah. can't fake your way to wealth. You can fake yourself. You can fake that you're a good listing agent. You can fake that you run a big team. You can fake all those things, but you can't fake cash flow, wealth, and those conversations because you'd have to have lived it in order to actually have the conversation. So it's the one thing uh, that you can't fake. Now, you see a lot, of, and I love that everyone else is talking about wealth these days. I think it's cool. I love that it's out there because this should be the conversations everyone's having. And that was that was my vision. So where will it go? As big as many people want to be in that journey, we'd love to have them. And I, I am honored to get to be a guide and play a small role in, in, in impacting so many. Well, Brett, I, I sit in that room. I sit in that mastermind. And I'm just being transparent. In some places, I'm great. In other places, I'm not so great. And so in that room, when you're in that room with that group of people, it exposes your weaknesses. And it lets you clearly understand you know, where you probably should be working a little harder. And so there are a lot of people that want to grow their wealth and then they're intimidated to go into the room where the room is bigger than them. Because uh, some people, they're in a room where the room is smaller than them. That's a comfortable room. However, when you go into a room that's larger than you and the balance sheets and the p and look quite different than yours, even though you may have a respectable sheet, you know, how, how do people get past that place? Because I know there's some people that say, well, I, I can't go in there because I don't have this. So I don't deserve to be in here. How does one get past that place? Because that can be intimidating. And then people get analysis paralysis and they don't do anything. They just stay in their little small room. So uh, my answer to that would be, number one, anytime you feel like the room's ahead of you, You've got to go back to your mindset and say, that means I'm now in the right room. I've finally got into the room I should be in. If you go into a room and everything they're talking about, you know, and you're nailing it, that's going to be the most comfortable, right? Because it's like, oh, these are my friends. We're all doing the same things. Everyone's kind of at the same place. I would argue that's the room I never want to be in. I, I don't want to be in a room where everyone's like, oh, we're kind of all here. You want to be in the room where someone is so far out in front, there's at least 20 to 50% of the things you do not know yet, right? I want to hear new concepts. That's where breakthroughs come from is being challenged. So for Emmerich, I love, I love your transparency. By the way, if you're in that room and you know everything, I can say, I don't know everything and I lead the room, right? I'm bringing in people because I want, I want to learn, right? So I would be, I wouldn't be transparent if I said, oh, everything in there, I've nailed it all, right? I go in there with the speakers. If you notice uh -huh. when our speakers go up there, I do most of the speaking, but when a speaker goes up there, I sit in the front row and I take notes and I leave a list of things to go do. And so I would just say, if, if any ever feel that way, like, hey, I shouldn't be in the room. Now, you know, that should be a trigger to go. All right, I'm getting in that room. Yes. Yes. Just like yes. every day I go, I get in my cold plunge every morning. I didn't get in this morning for a variety of reasons, but um, I get in there every morning. And it's the hardest thing I do every day, because no matter how many days you do it, jumping into 39 degree water at six in the morning, especially in the winter when it's colder. It's one thing when it's 110 in Arizona, you jump in there. But it's the hard, every day I try to talk myself out of it. And every day, the minute my mind goes, don't do it, I go, boom, all the way under, right? And I'm just frozen. So I feel the same way about the room, right? You got to just jump in and then you're going to get the, you'll get the win from, from jumping in. Really quick off topic about this cold plunge, <laughs> right? And, and because that's deep, you know, at six o'clock in the morning, you don't want to do it. However you do it, that's a mindset. That's a mindset of success. That's a mindset of breaking through a barrier. For a normal person, what could be something that they could use to break through a barrier at six o'clock in the morning? I know for me, going to the gym at quarter after five is not one of my favorite things. However, when I leave the gym, I understand what I feel like. So what's something that people can do to get through that 
that because the people are highly successful, they do things early in the morning that they don't want to do. So what's something that people can do to just start warming themselves up to think differently about life and themselves and maybe money? I would pick the thing you're avoiding, right? I think for all of us, there's something in our life we're avoiding because we're going to wait until we're going to wait. Oh, I'll do it later in the day. I'll do it next week. I'll do it next month. I would say whatever that thing you're avoiding is that you could, it's a daily thing. Do it tomorrow. Right. Just go do it, do it and do it. I mean, first thing it, it'll, it, because once you do it, the reason why I've loved this cold plunge, I mean, look, there's a, a variety of health benefits and I hope they're all true. Uh, that's not why I do it, right? I do it for those things, but I, I, I literally have stuck in it because it's the hardest thing to do. And I find when I do it every morning, then I get to my office or I'm doing something in business or something in my life that's hard. And it's not as hard because I already did something that was really hard when I woke up. So the next thing you're like, I'll knock this out. It's no problem. And it just sets you up because having a really big life doesn't mean you have less problems. And I think that's one of the myths of money, right? Like, yeah. oh, I get to a certain level and all oh, the problems go away, the people issues, right. the family stuff, and all of it's easier. No, it's not. It's actually harder because the more things you acquire, the bigger your world gets, you have more people, right? More people, more things, more stuff right. that all have to be managed. And so what I would tell you is you, the problems don't, the problems get bigger. You just get radically better. When you see those really successful people that are crushing it, they've built systems and models. They're just better at dealing with all of it because they've been doing the hard things for so long. Right. And I, I want to leave it alone at this because um, I want Daniel to come back in. That That's that whole conversation of be, do, have. When, be, when you don't have money, you say, if I had what you have, I can do what you do and I can be who you are. When really the be, do, have is like you have to be who I am first and then do the things that I do. And then you can have the things that I have. And we've had this is the second week, Daniel, that I've had this conversation yeah. about be, do, have. And, and it just keeps coming up in this whole money conversation. So thank you for that, Brett, because we, we have to focus on being that person first when we start talking about wealth. We have to be that person. I want to go. I want to go one more second there. So, Emmerich, that that's the part, right? Before you have to start living and being the person that would have that money, before right. you have the money, right? So, like, if you're if you're watching, and I'm just making up numbers that are round numbers, so it's not meant to you know get anyone off track. But if you're making five hundred thousand dollars a year and you want to make a million dollars a year, you've got to start living and making decisions as if your time's worth a million dollars a year. But you've got to do it before you get the money. That's the part mm -hmm. that people miss. So you said, I've got to be the person first because then the money will follow. The other things you want will follow. But if you're not living at that level, it's not sustainable. You might trick it one year and get there, but for sustainable right. durable income and wealth, you got to be the person first and you got to do the hard thing. And just not being, we can't be tricked by saying being that person means I have to spend the money that that person is spending. That's the tricky part. Yeah, That's the tricky part because that's why people have expensive cards, expensive Clothes because they, they think that's being that person and no, that's having what that person had. That's not the habits that make that person to earn what they earn. And we got to be careful about that. So, Daniel, you, you were saying something. I kind of cut you off. I apologize. But that whole be do have just popped up. So no, it's, it's definitely carrying <laughs> over from our last episode. And I think if you don't have a cold plunge, one of the easiest things Gary Brecker talks about is just take your hot shower, clean yourself, do your thing. Turn the water all the way cold, wait about 30 seconds and plunge. It's, it's, it's a, it's a simple concept to get it and get it before you have, you have the wealth to be able to go to pay for the self filtration yeah. actual plunge thing, right? Yeah. Oh, there, there's easy ways to do it that don't cost money, right? You go get three bags of ice. Isn't that expensive? F fill your bag cold, <laughs> fill three bags of ice and get in there. You get the same effect. Yeah, definitely. For a lot of the people that are listening on this call, we, we've talked about over the, over, over our episodes about your wealth team. Yeah. So when you think about your wealth team, who who are the people that you need in your corner or that you need to sought after to get to be a part of that wealth team uh, for you? Yeah. So I'll give them to you. So number one, right? Easiest one, you got to have a CPA slash and or tax strategist, right? Your CPA may or may not be the person to help implement tax strategy. And what I mean by that is some CPAs and accountants, right, are just taking the numbers you give them. They're popping them in your tax return. They're looking for errors. And they're making sure you meet all the requirements for the IRS, right? That's a valuable skill. That doesn't do anything to help with your taxes. 
A separate person will be like, hey, Daniel, I noticed you bought some rental properties. Should we look at a cost segregation because you're in real estate? Should we look at how your you know, 199A, as that might relate to increasing or decreasing your payroll? Should we look at the Augusta rule? Should we start looking at tax strategies that you could implement? So that's what, so number one, the person is a CPA slash tax strategist. Those may or may not be the same person. Mm-hmm. Next person I think is a, your estate attorney. Look, if you're planning on being wealthy, how you get that money to the people or causes you care about is a very strategic endeavor. You've got to be really specific in how you do it, and you got to be very thoughtful. So you need someone who can take your ideas and thoughts about wealth and money and make sure those are passed on. And when you're passing on uh, wealth, there's more to wealth than just dollars and cents and money, right? You're passing on your ideas, your beliefs. Like there's things in my estate that are designed to keep my kids in close relationship. And I'll just give you an example. I've got this cabin in the mountains. It's like a legacy type property that it's a separate trust that will fund it and pay for all the expenses indefinitely. But my kids are never allowed to sell it, right? They have to. So it just sits there until they go to use it. But what am I building into that, Daniel? I'm building in that hopefully the three of them are going to go to the cabin and go hang out to where they were at kids when they're older, right? So long after I'm gone, I'm trying to build in this connectivity there. So a state attorney is my second one. Third one, I think you need a banker. Like your banker, whoever you work with, is not going to likely be some large, huge institution. It's probably going to be a small local or regional bank that actually okay. wants to do business with you and wants to back you as you grow. I never knew how banking worked till about five years ago. I just thought, you know, it all kind of works the same. And what I've learned is that there are these banks that I, I text my lender yesterday. This will be a really specific example. I'm considering buying this RV storage in the mountains. It's like a $3 million investment. And I just text him. I said, hey, if I'm putting 50% down, give me rates, terms, and pricing on this. He shoots me a text back. Dude, I could close that in 45 days. I might have to provide him a couple of updated documents, but largely because they do all my other stuff, it's already ready to go, right? So like, I think your banker matters. So th- those are three. Next, your real estate attorney. You're going to you're going to be in real estate. Stuff is going to come up, agreements, leases, evictions, foreclosures. You need a great real estate attorney. So those are the four I always start with. I think those I would start there, and you you know as your world grows, it can expand beyond that. But those are four where I would no question you need all those people to be in your corner. And they've got to be excellent. So if you go to one of your advisors and they're not helping you implement your plan, you have the wrong person. Like, well, he'll all the time. I'll say, well, my CPA said you can't do that or my, that doesn't work in my world. And I'm like, cool. Change the way you're asking the question. Mm-hmm. All the questions are not, can I do the Augusta rule? How do I do it so that you're comfortable with it? Can you help me implement this in my life? And so those are just getting your advisors and getting good at having those conversations. Well, that's one of the hardest things for real estate agents that I've learned is we already figured out how to make the money, but keeping it is a whole different strategy that needs to that needs to be front and center in like paying 40 percent taxes year over year is just <laughs> that isn't it. There's there's other ways that we can protect our money, you know? Well, there's there's a whole plan, right? The entire the government gives you they're not loopholes, right? They yeah. create incentives for all of us to go solve certain problems if we want to. Like the more houses we own, right, that helps having rental properties available for people to have a place to live. What's the incentive? Increased depreciation if you want it, right? If you want to go in the energy sector, there's a ton of credits there, right? So there's all these incentives. You get to pick where you play. And if you want to just pay a lot of tax, you can do that too. So it's in the, the tax law is written very unfairly in that if you want to do it, you can get all you want. You don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. But the people that play the game will build more wealth because taxes are one of those expenses that if we can reduce it and we save that money, like when I start talking about wealth, if I have a room of high income earners, I always start with taxes because if we can free up a hundred grand a year, they can use that extra hundred thousand to go buy another piece of real estate or another investment that creates more cash flow that ultimately helps them get wealthy. Absolutely. And to, to piggyback on that, tell us a little bit of, I mean, there, there's a lot of different expansion networks and different networks out there that provide value. And I think yours is so unique. I mean, you, you named it the Be Wealthy Network, which is so different than Sell More Houses Network or whatever, right? So right. tell us a little bit about that Be Wealthy Network. What is the value add? Why do agents join? And what kind of impact do you make on their businesses? 
So I think we're totally different. I don't think I know we're totally different than other expansion group out there. And for a simple reason, number one, we don't own your location. So a lot of these other, they own it and then you're going to be their partner in it. Um, that's not our model. So we believe that real estate agents have skills again to create massive wealth. They just need the unlock and the knowledge and the systems to go into the wealth side. Our entire focus and our network is to help people become wealthy. Right, using their real estate team as a vehicle to go create that wealth. So where we're different, number one, we don't own it. It's always your business. And we take a little small, small fee out of every transaction to go make that happen. And then we're helping you go use the transactions you're doing. How can we be more strategic so that you ultimately build the wealth to hit whatever your plan is? So same concept of that we're teaching in our masterminds, all of our trainings. It's just in the network, you're getting it closer to us because we can be more involved because we're working with you and we're partners in that outcome, not partners in terms of ownership in the business. They always own it. We're just there to power them. So I think what makes us different, we're actually talking about the wealth side, right? So we are yeah. helping them get their passive income up. So then when, if they're at the end of their career, they're going to say, oh my gosh, I'm ridiculously wealthy. I, I'm so glad I was in real estate and I use my time as an agent to ultimately create, you know, legacy generational wealth for whatever people or causes they care about. Yeah, I think catching fire right now, too, when you start seeing the success, the wealth success, not necessarily how many houses they sold, but the mindset shift, the wealth building, the flipping, the wholesaling, some of these other or quick flips, um, some of these other things that people never even considered or thought about. But when they can plug into a network like that and say, hey, Brett, I have a deal. What do I do? And you're like, boom, boom, boom. It completely changes the game on the trajectory of that that team or that solo agent's career. And one of the things that, you know, people also have to understand is that they're always thinking about what does it cost me to do that? I think, I believe that 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 limits people to say, well, if I join Be Wealthy, then I'm going to spend money. How much is it going to cost me? And maybe I can do it on my own. So I love that. So I, I actually heard this a long time ago and I've repurposed it and it says there's no cost in life, right? There are no costs. There's good investments and bad investments. And that's in everything, Like right? You're going yeah. to buy a new, if you're going to buy a new shirt, that's not a cost. The shirt costs what it costs. It's either a good investment, meaning that you like it, it's going to last a long time, whatever the reason is, or it's a bad investment. It ripped early and it went away. So there's no cost. There's good and bad investments. So if someone joins anyone's world, if it's our world, and that investment is either going to be the greatest investment they've ever made, or it might be a poor investment. The, the difference is they get to choose, right? It's them that are choosing. Our model works because we've got so many people now in there that are implementing, right? So um, my answer would be that there's no cost, there's good and bad investments. The other thought I have is that most folks believe the only way to make money in terms of real estate investment is flipping a home, right? I buy a home, I flip it, right? Daniel, that would have been, I think early on might've been one of our conversations. Hey, I buy yeah. homes and flip it. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's like 10 different things we could do, right? So maybe you want to sell that contract. Maybe we want to quick flip it. Maybe we want to, do you want to become the bank here? What if we don't fix it all the way up and we just, you know, clean it up and sell it to an end buyer because it's in really good condition uh, and we're willing to do that? Like there's lots in like, what about a lease per in certain scenarios, a lease purchase might make sense, right? So there's all these different variables. And I think people start where they only have one exit. And the biggest thing we are going to tell them is there, there could be six to 10 exits on a deal. We just need to show you what those are so that you could take advantage of it. And the more exits you have, I mean, the more deals you could actually do. Yeah. And I think it's important to have people in your life and in your in your world that will call you on your bullshit. So a funny story, I was with Brett a couple of weeks ago and I was talking to him about how, you know, um, things are going fairly well. And, you know, I had to I had to buy a new car and, you know, I have, a, I have three kids. They're all growing. I have four dogs. And he goes, oh, so you sent the wire, right? I'm like, no, I I I financed it. He said, you did what? I said, I financed. He said, why would we do that? We're buying a depreciating asset and you financed it, send the wire. And so I think it's important to have those kind of people in your life that are gonna call you and hold you accountable to the principles of the things that need to get done for you to continue to stay on that journey of building wealth. And so I forever appreciate you and hopefully uh, we can stay and hopefully you can stay as my, my coach. I mean, Brett's my real estate coach, my marriage counselor, my punching bag sometimes I'm pissed off at thing. Like Brett, does, Brett wears many hats when uh, we jump on our coaching calls. I'm forever grateful, brother. Well, I, I would say one more thing. I think you made a really good point that I think people don't think about. When you're going to buy anything, right? To me, if it doesn't cash flow, right? So that would 
Houses, cash flow, if you're buying them right. If it's an investment purpose that has cash flow, I'm okay with debt. But any toys, cars, all that stuff should always be paid cash. What that forces you to do is it forces you to right-size the purchase. It's really easy to go sign up for a $1,000 payment, right? Everybody can do that. What's hard is hitting the button and sending a $100,000 wire, right? I don't know how long I've wanted um, the brand new Tesla, right? But I am, and it's not that I don't have the money. I just always compare the opportunity costs. I'm always like, hey, I want to go buy another house, another house, another house. So, you know, I did it. My wife knows, like, when I buy something, we send a wire, right? All toys are paid with the wire. And when you start living that, you'll just right-size all the purchases. And you'll make the right decision. So I, I would tell anybody on here, if you got any debt, get out of bad debt. Debt is just taking away from your future income, right? If it doesn't have cash flow attached to it, you're just taking yes. away from your future income, and you're living higher today than you should be. So force yourself, by forcing yourself to save, in this example, a hundred grand, like in my Tesla example, and then send the wire. By the way, probably when you get to the hundred grand save, you're going to go, "Nah, my car's fine, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna let it ride a little further, or whatever." So I would just say, the principle is more important than the actual doing of it. If you can always, it's the whole delayed gratification. The world's gotten so good at thinking you need all of these things, right? You need, you know, and I know, brother Daniel, we're we're on the sleep eight. We are connected on that whole thing. I couldn't live without a sleep eight. <laughs> But well, the world's out there. You need all these things, which is great. You just need to make sure that your whole world's set up before you start getting too many uh, things and stuff, as we say. Well, it's those principles. And I think that's one thing that you live incredibly by is you truly have principles behind spending money, investing money, making money. And that's one thing I think that all of us can learn is what, it, what are your principles that you stand by and do you hold true to them? Because that'll keep you that'll keep you right sized through the chaos, through the success and through the failure. Come 100%. As we start wrapping up, Emmerich, any last words, brother? Well, I'm just going to say just one word. Hey, Brett, I love KW Wealth. I love the masterminds. I'm excited. I'll see you in January. For those who are listening to this and aren't involved with KW Wealth, get involved with KW Wealth. Get involved with Be Wealthy. Uh, change the way you look at things and the things you look at will change. And we absolutely have to look at our money differently. I love that. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Thanks for all you do, brother. Those of you that, that are listening, if you're not in this man's ecosystem, do anything and everything that you can to go spend some time, join the mastermind, join the KW Wealth Network. Um, when you start, to, to Emmerich's point, when you start looking at things differently, everything around you starts to change. And I'm glad that we had this wealth conversation. Thank you, Brett, for your time. I appreciate you being on, brother. Great for you guys. Appreciate you guys. Until next time, guys. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. The views, thoughts, and opinions of the guest represent those of the guest and not KWRI and its affiliates and should not be construed as financial, economic, legal, tax, or other advice. This podcast is provided without any warranty or guarantee of its accuracy, completeness, timeliness, or results from using the information.